Hello, hello, is that okay? Okay, uh, so good evening everyone. Um, so we just looked at chronobiology lab and circadian behavior at a population level. I now take you to neurogenetics of circadian behavior as I take you along behavioral neurogenetics lab. Um, and the basic theme of the lab has been to understand behavior and the neuronal circuits that underlie uh, this, uh, I mean, different behaviors. A major focus of the lab has been to look at rhythmic behavior in animals, specifically those that, have, that are controlled by the circadian clock. Uh, you might recall from Professor Shiba Vasu's talk that uh, there are three components that bring about circadian behavior. The input to the circadian clock in the form of light, temperature, humidity, even food, um, the clock itself that comprises of the neurons in the brain, and various rhythmic outputs in the form of rhythmic feeding, rhythmic sleep and wake behavior, and many other physiological and metabolic processes. Um, our lab works at all these three levels of input in the form of temperature input and feeding input to the clock. We also look at the clock level by understanding the sort of neuronal communications that uh, occur within the neuronal subgroups of the circadian uh, system. And we also look at rhythmic feeding and rhythmic sleep and wake uh, behavior in the flies. I first look at, I'll first take you to uh, what we, uh, about temperature as an input for the circadian, uh, for the circadian clock. And we know that temperature modulates rhythmic behavior. Uh, so if I, if flies are placed in a, in a condition where they experience a gradual increase in temperature and uh, something that simulates normal, in, normal changes in daily temperature while all other uh, conditions are constant like light, um, flies display this particular uh, spike in activity when they experience very high temperatures of close to 32 degrees. However, when this um, temperature, this high, um, this a uh, high temperature is prolonged throughout the day along with light and dark that uh, simulates day and night in uh, for flies. What we see is that flies that originally were crepuscular and showed bouts of activity around dawn and dusk now become more nocturnal and push their activity into the dark. So clearly there is an interaction of the temperature circuit and this phasing of activity which is controlled by the central circuit. Antara Das in the lab identified the role of a temperature sensitive protein, the thermoreceptor DTRIP-A1 in both these behavior, behaviors and currently we are, we are trying to ask how these behaviors are modulated at the levels of which neurotransmitters might be involved, which neurons of these two different circuits, the temperature circuit and the activity rest central clock, these two interact and also which higher brain centers uh, are involved in bringing about these different behaviors. Uh, moving to the clock, we know that the central clock in the fly brain consists of about 150 neurons that are distributed equally in the two hemispheres of the brain. Uh, we also know that these different subsets of brain, uh, different subsets of the clock neurons that are color coded here depending on their location in the brain, uh, interact and communicate amongst each other via uh, chemical signals like neurotransmitters, which brings about synchrony within these different neuronal clusters and thereby bring about a synchronous behavior, circadian behavior. Aishwarya Ayer in the lab looks at how um, electrical communication via gap junctions um, is involved in bringing about synchrony amongst the uh, neurons, apart from just what is known about the chemical communication. Um, sleep. Sleep and uh, sleep is known to be an output of the circadian clock because the clock times when an organism uh, falls asleep. Uh, Sheetal Poddar in the lab has now identified a critical circadian output uh, signaling pathway um, via the pigment dispersing factor, which is now, she's identified this to be part of the sleep circuit as well. Uh, apart from this, um, Sheetal was also interested in looking at how the homeostat in the uh, fly, in the in the brain, which controls how well and how much an organism sleeps, how these two interact to bring about sleep in an organism, and what she ident what she finds is that there seems to be a uh, unidirectional interaction or an influence of the clock onto the homeostat. 
Um, there are other interesting things that you might want to know about, uh, about the homeostat, and you can catch her sometime whenever after the session. Uh, another behavior that we are interested to look at in the uh, uh, lab is feeding behavior, specifically because feeding, uh, uh, feeding behavior and food availability seems to act as an input as well as an output for the clock. Uh, Viveka Singh in the lab asked how um, can food act as a time cue for the central clock. And what it looks like, uh, and what she's able to say is that the central clock, sorry, the central clock does not get influenced by the, uh, by the specific feeding uh, timing of food that is given to the clock. In other words, the activity clock does not get influenced by uh, food cues. Food does not act as a time cue for the uh, fly clock. Another thing that she's interested in is looking at rhythmic feeding behavior. And rhythmic feeding seems to be, con is also known to be controlled by um, uh, clocks outside of the central clocks. And these tissues are, uh, are analogous to the mammalian liver. So she asked if the activity clock, which is controlled by the central clock, uh, the, and the feeding clock, which is analogous to the liver, interact. And she's trying to look at how, the, how these two influence to bring about timed feeding in animals. Uh, another approach to look at the neuronal basis of circadian behavior is to look at how, uh, is to look at closely related drosophilid species. Uh, here we look at uh, drosophila menelogaster. This is an activity profile across the time of the day. Um, and this solid line is drosophila melanogaster. And you see that there are two bouts of activity, like I already mentioned one around morning or dawn and one around evening. In contrast, what you see in Drosophila ananasi, shown by this dotted phase, is a single bout of activity around morning. So uh, Priya uh, uh, started off trying to understand uh, this, uh, the differences in these behaviors. And later, Revati and now Prisa Kundu in the lab look at, uh, have tried to look at the different clock properties and I found some interesting differences in the clock properties and the different uh, circadian neurons that, that are present in, the, in these two species. And perhaps, um, which suggests that these differences might be the causes that drive these different patterns of behavior in these two uh, different species. Uh, now I move from using the uh, fly as a uh, uh, to study circadian behavior uh, I now move to how we can, how we have been able to use the circadian model to understand neurodegenerative disorder, disorders. And Pavitra Prakash in the lab started off trying to understand Huntington's disease. Uh, Huntington's disease is known, uh, is a very commonly known genetic disease. And it is known uh, that the severity of this disease in uh, animals depends on the number of, number of glutamine repeats in the protein which causes the accumulation or aggregation of these proteins in the neurons, causing, their, um, uh, causing the death of these neurons. It is also known that uh, Huntington's disease specifically targets, us, targets certain neurons in the brain, not affecting the others. What is impressive is that all these different symptoms can be reproduced or uh, replicated in the fly system when we express the toxic, this toxic protein in the fly. Um, uh, and this sort of gives a good handle. It's, it's like an excellent model to study something like uh, Huntington's disease as well. Uh, one of the interesting, uh, of the many different results that we have uh, obtained till now, one of the interesting results is how high temperature uh, is able to improve the disease phenotype or the progression of this disease in flies. And this sort of suggested that uh, the heat shock protein pathway uh, at the cellular level might be involved. Uh, another student, um, another student, Payal Ganguly, uh, looked at how uh, certain autophagy proteins, when upregulated, were able to ameliorate certain uh, the disease phenotype. And the current focus of the lab has now been to look at how these two pathways, the heat shock protein pathway and the autophagy pathway, in turn, are uh, involved in um, improving the disease phenotype. Um, okay, now from moving from aggregation at cellular levels, we look at now a very different behavior, aggregation behavior that has recently been established in the lab by Ruthvish Kulkarni. 
Uh, so aggregation behavior refers to the tendency of organisms to come together in space and time. Uh, and they could be for various reasons. One of which could be against a predator. It could be to share a common resource like near a watering hole for to share water or food. It could also be under certain social factors where you um, interact to exchange, in, exchange information or um, any such social reason. Uh, it's also known that there are multiple um, social insects that uh, do uh, aggregate. Uh, but apart from that, flies, which are known to be non-social insects, also aggregate in the absence of uh, predators or food. So this suggests that there might be certain social factors that drive this sort of aggregation of flies in even in the absence of any other obvious resource or predator. So Rutwij is trying to ask what these social interactions might be that bring about the uh, fly aggregation in, uh, in the lab. Uh, so with that, I'll just briefly summarize the basic, the general themes that we look at. We look at different aspects of circadian behavior, like temperature, neuronal communication, feeding, um, the sleep, and the comparative species, the comparative study of Drosophilus. We also look at how the circadian model can be used as a Huntington's disease model. And we also look at aggregation behavior. Uh, with that, this is the team except for Antra. This is Aishwarya Ayer, uh, Sheetal, pa uh, Payal Ganguly, Chitrang, who now works with uh, Chronobiology Lab, Viveka Singh, Professor Sheba Vasu, Pavitra Prakash, Preetha, Rutwit, and Sushma. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you all for your attention. We can take some questions. Do we have questions for Ishwarya? For all, how many hours they sleep? Hours. How many hours? Uh, you said they'll sleep. They, they sleep throughout the night. Yeah, much like us. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, the food, yeah, the same type of food. Uh, yeah. Oh, that is. Oh, uh, it's generally known that when uh, flies are deprived of food, they become hyperactive. And oh. The diff morning and evening, that is controlled by the, yeah. It's like how diurnal animals are active during the day or nocturnal are active. These animals are crepuscular or they have, they're active only around certain times of the day. So that's around dawn and dusk. Like that. Uh, I wanted to make a comment so that um, for the people that listen to my talk and to your talk, kind of are aware yeah of a difference between yeah. honeybees yeah. and uh, Drosophila. So actually, we in honeybees kind of propose that foraging behavior does something to the, uh, to the clock in the brain. Whereas the Drosophila, the feeding behavior mm -hmm. does not affect the clock in the brain. This is not a, that's not a quarrel. At the moment, it's a problem. So one thing is that we still have to demonstrate, we it's in the brain, but we still have to demonstrate it is the clock neurons that are changing yeah. during uh, when we kind of do the expression changes. It still kind of like raises an interesting question. What is foraging in social bees? It is not feeding, as I said, kind of the bees uh, are in the hive. Foraging is more like an activity. So I only wanted to highlight that here is an interesting problem in the clock in insects, in the difference between Drosophila and honeybees, which is really interesting. So kind of just to make a comment on that. I'm not saying, I mean, no one is wrong. No. <laughs>